everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about Alan Turing and the feasibility of HBO's new show Westworld. If you haven't seen it, it's worth checking out, but either way, it's a series set in the future where wealthy people live out their fantasies in a Wild West theme park populated by lifelike robots called hosts. They're basically like advanced video game NPCs with daily cycles and loops and quest lines, and you're free to talk to them and help them or go on a murderous rampage. It's kind of like Grand Theft Auto or I guess Red Dead Redemption in real life. But very quickly in the show, we're led to wonder what makes the hosts different from us, or in another way, what makes us especially human? Alan Turing famously asked these questions, can machines think, in his 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. In it, he describes an imitation game where you have player A, a human, and player B, a machine, who would both talk to an interrogator, call them player C, through a text-only screen. C asks questions and tries to determine which player is the human and which is the machine based on their answers. And there are several other interpretations of the test, but this is kind of the most basic. Turing reframes his prior question from can machines think to are there imaginable digital computers which would do well in the imitation game? If we put the hosts of Westworld to this test, they'd have some easy tells. For example, they're programmed never to truly harm guests, allegedly, and when shown evidence of the outside world, they just say, it doesn't look like anything to me. So you could clearly ask them certain questions to get them to say those answers that you would expect them to say based on the restrictions of the park. But without those limitations, it seems like the hosts could pass the Turing test many times over. He also proposed we could construct an AI to pass the test by the year 2000 with 10 to the 9 bytes or 1 gigabyte of memory. He also thought the way we do it is by programming a model of a child's brain, because it would be simpler, and then give it an education just like any other human child in order to create an adult human level intelligence thinking machine in that way. And I think most would agree at this point that we're actually really, really far from understanding exactly how all the neurons and electrical impulses in the brain works. And a child's brain in some ways is even more complicated than an adult brain because many of the ways we acquire knowledge and language and grow and change are still pretty mysterious even to neuroscience researchers. Um, I guess while we're talking about his paper, there's also a funny clause where he discusses the totally legitimate argument that we may need to account for our latent ESP psychic powers that people may soon develop. I think there was some statistically significant research happening back then, but he even designed a variation of the imitation game to account for actual psychic powers. Let that sink in. <laughs> I don't know. This is why you should read the, the primary sources, kids. It's, it's fun to notice these details. In any case, Many other experts and researchers during that time also had these huge lofty expectations and experiment ideas, and that resulted in a lot of grants being revoked and projects being defunded and funded in cycles by the government. And much of that research still had a lot of untapped value, even if the results didn't come back as like magically brilliant as they expected. Like perceptrons, for example, were a neural network introduced in the 1950s. But after there was a paper that showed it, it didn't meet the huge expectations and there were a lot more limitations to perceptrons than they had previously thought, almost all research on the whole field of connectionism and neural networks kind of halted for over a decade. And this was kind of a common theme from the 50s up until the 90s of AI research being sort of on and off. I think people also quickly learned that things that are simple for human two-year-olds, like knowing this is a dog and this is a cat, those things are pretty difficult for computers. While things that are difficult for humans, like counting to a million in less than a second, are easy for computers. And bridging this gap is way more challenging than simply having more processing power or using a single magic algorithm or technique. But today we have created several AIs that have passed the test. But once again, not necessarily for hyper-advanced intelligence. 
One famous example was Eliza in 1996. She was essentially a chatbot therapist that would listen to your problems, repeat what you've told her, and then say something like, wow, that sounds hard, or tell me more about that. And funny enough, some people really did believe she was real and did get legitimate relief from feeling listened to in that way, I suppose. And most recently, in 2014, an AI named Eugene Gustman also passed the test. His creators gave him the character of a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy. 13 years old, because in their words, it's an age where there's some forgiveness for a lack of general knowledge, and Ukrainian with English as a second language, so that mistakes with the language may be overlooked as well. So in my opinion, a big part of Eugene passing was due to a lot of forgiveness and mistakes that were in line with the AI's character design. So it's nowhere near an actual sentient Eastern European kid living in a computer. But this also calls into question whether the Turing test is really a good metric to determine artificial intelligence. Even if we couldn't distinguish the AI from the human, if it's only imitating human behavior and not understanding the meaning or context, then is it really thinking? Or is it simply performing well at the imitation game? In this sense, Turing's question, are there imaginable digital computers which would do well in the imitation game, that may not be the best way to redefine can machines think. We'll likely need different tests and different measures and even definitions of what thinking really means. In the case of Westworld, it seems the park's overarching corporation intended to have machines that simply passed the imitation game for the guests, but had no deeper understanding of the world. So any atrocities committed to the hosts would never register as anything more than sensory log data. But let's scale back from the sci-fi future world and take a look at a thinking algorithm that already exists today, YouTube's recommendation system. Now I know it's been contentious, YouTube claims there have been no changes, but viewers have seen changes. No matter what the reality is, I could see how it would be wonky even if there were no changes from the engineers, and I could see how it definitely would be if there were changes from the engineers. Basically, I don't know how it works, but my best guess is is that it takes in hundreds of variables, like your age, gender, country, past likes, subscriptions, all sorts of things, and puts it in an equation and spits out an answer, like a list of recommended videos for you for today. Now that's really simplifying it, but let's just think of it that way for now. So if you click on a recommended video from YouTube, the algorithm will kind of reward itself and update its coefficients to say, this was good, good job, me, <laughs> which will then give you better stuff later, hopefully. So is this machine thinking about what videos to show you? Depending on how we define thinking, this could go either way as well. What's interesting about that scenario is that it's not just a calculator finding the answer to a really complicated arithmetic problem that gets you videos, but it constantly adjusts itself to improve. And even though I wouldn't say it's a sentient decision-making creature, it does remind me of a moment in Westworld where they talk about how the hosts like conversing with each other to try and improve their social interactions and seem more human, even though talking to another host really would have no direct utility for their primary goals. At least that's what I would think. And if we say there's some complicated algorithm in the host telling it what their next word or action should be, then perhaps a thinking being is anything that learns from mistakes or makes decisions on past knowledge. It's also mentioned in the show that a host requires memories to form consciousness, and erasing all memories would render them brain dead. So a host's memories would just be raw data with every sensory detail perfectly preserved. So perhaps memories are data, and the process of acting on and learning from that data creates a form of thinking or consciousness, even if it's not attempting to mimic a human at all, like a recommendation algorithm or a self-driving car. Now, I'm not saying this is the right way to look at it. You can kind of define the word however you want and go from there. Um, but it is interesting to kind of expand our definitions and perception of what AI is because we're surrounded by advanced artificial intelligence and machine learning in the tools and apps we use all the time. And it's easy not to realize that because it feels so normal. 
So can we create sentient human-like hosts from Westworld? Or can machines think? Maybe the more relevant question is, can we define that question in a specific and tangible way with specific measures and metrics that may or may not be different from the imitation game? So yeah, I hope this video gave you some food for thought. There's so much I want to talk about uh, with questions and discussions on AI, ethics, and technology for future videos. So if you like that stuff, then definitely subscribe. Uh, you can also show support by taking a look at my Patreon. It's $1 for all benefits. Everything goes right back to the show. You'll get an invite to our Discord server, which has been pretty active and awesome so far. And then this month on the Patreon feed, I'll post my fully annotated copy of Turing's paper that I read while researching this video, along with some of my thoughts on other historical areas that didn't quite make it into this video. But whether you support me there or not, it's no big deal if you do or you don't. I'm also streaming periodically, so be sure to follow me on Twitch below and Twitter to get the stream announcements because Oh my god, you guys! I just adopted a cat! Oh my god, I'm so excited! I'm probably, probably just show some pictures of her. Oh my god, she's so cute. She's so sweet. She was abandoned and she's just a little baby fuzzy princess sweetheart. And I love her so much. So I'm probably gonna do uh, a cat stream at some point so you guys can meet her and ask her any questions. <laughs> oh god, I sound so crazy. Anyway guys, look out for that. And I hope you're all having a very happy day wherever you are. I'll see you guys soon. Bye!